here for our lunch table talk. I'm gonna give folks a couple minutes to stream in here. So we'll start around 12.03. I think we'll get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Tope Falaran, and I'm the executive director at the Institute for Policy Studies. I'm so happy to welcome you to our fourth Institute for Policy Studies lunch table talk. IPS is a research organization that works with social movements to turn progressive policy ideas into action. This series is a casual space for our expert researchers to share what they've been working on recently. I'm so pleased to introduce Phyllis Bennis, who directs our new internationalism project here at IPS. John Pfeffer, who directs our Foreign Policy and Focus Project, and Karee Peterson-Smith, who is our Michael Ratner Middle East Fellow. <clears throat> our last table talk conversation was so popular that we've decided to continue that conversation. We'll be talking about the crisis in Ukraine, and our experts will provide their analysis about the latest developments there. Thanks so much for taking the time to be here. Please write any additional questions you have in the Q&A box throughout the talk or by commenting if you're watching on Facebook and our team will answer as many as they can. Uh, thanks to all of you once again for joining us uh, in this conversation. I thought I'd start with John and ask if you could just provide like a brief overview of what's happening in Ukraine right now so we can have a kind of sort of foundation for this conversation. Sure, thanks Tope and, and thanks everyone for, for joining us today. Uh, I'll keep this brief because we got a lot of questions and I'm sure you have more of them. Um, as most of you know, I'm sure the, the war in Ukraine has not gone as uh, Moscow had initially anticipated. In other words, the effort to take control of Kiev and other major cities largely failed. Uh, Russian forces pulled back from uh, surrounding Kiev and other major cities to focus more on uh, expanding Russian control of the Donbass, the Eastern regions prior to the war, um, Russian backed forces controlled about 35% of the Donbass and uh, Russia hopes to expand that as well as a kind of Southern corridor that connects the Donbass to um, uh, the Crimean Peninsula and points further West, including Odessa, possibly to basically turn Ukraine into a landlocked country. Um, the sanctions have tightened on uh, Russia. We've seen the effect on the Russian economy. Um, and uh, the focus most recently has been on reducing uh, 
uh, the imports of Russian fossil fuels, gas, uh, and oil with the European Union in particular, uh, hoping to really shut off the uh, incoming supplies even earlier than the end of this year with a couple of countries balking, um, Hungary and Slovakia in particular. Uh, and uh, since we're on the topic of Europe, uh, Finland and Sweden indicating that they are even more eager to join NATO uh, than they had obviously before the invasion began. Um, the United States has uh, led the way in providing military assistance with a three, $33 billion um, piece of legislation on the table, making its way through Congress with a couple of disagreements, but probably will attract bipartisan support at some point um, and at some figure. Um, We've seen a lot of high profile people visiting Ukraine uh, in solidarity with uh, uh, President Zelensky, Boris Johnson, uh, most recently Nancy Pelosi with a delegation of uh, Democratic Party legislators. And then finally, the question of negotiations. Well, where are we with negotiations? And there really hasn't been a lot of movement um, since the end of March, Ukraine released a 10 point um, plan basically that included neutrality, but the sticking point was really the security guarantees. In other words, what would happen if Ukraine were to be attacked again? Uh, who would come to its assistance? Um, most recently, Russia has uh, said that sanctions should be part of any negotiated settlement. And Ukraine has said, well, no, that's really up to uh, the folks who are sanctioning you. And it's really not, should not be part of the peace negotiations. So that's a very quick update of, of where we are right now. Thank you so much, John. It's really, really helpful. Um, we received a bunch of great questions from our Zoom uh, registration forms. And one of the most, I, I suppose, uh, common questions, it seems, is there's a lot of concern about the information that Russians are getting about this conflict from their media. There's a lot of concern out there, it seems, about misinformation and disinformation. Phyllis, I was perhaps going to ask you um, if you could talk a little bit about how, um, is there any possible way to get sort of really accurate information uh, about Putin to the Russian public and what he's doing? Well, thanks, Topay, and thanks, John, for a good update, and thanks to all of you for listening. I think that's a really hard question. I think that there's little doubt that people are getting a very distorted view of what's happening in Ukraine, uh, people in Russia. Um, the punishment for, for journalists or others who report on the war uh, can be up to 15 years in prison. People are being jailed at uh, protests and the level of repression overall in Russia has significantly increased. With all of that, it's rather astonishing that there has been a continuing anti-war uh, presence that's emerged in Russia. There, there were protests early on. They're not so frequent now, I think because of the clampdown, the, the threat of, uh, of 15 years in prison is, is a, a very serious threat. Uh, and journalists are being targeted as well. So it's a, it's a very serious repressive environment. I don't see a way that, uh, that we have in the United States or in the West um, where we can take responsibility for getting good information to Russians. I think we have a problem somewhat here in the United States at getting solid information here. I think that one of the ironies of the, uh, of the war in Ukraine is that we are seeing a kind of mobilization of the press in covering this war at a 24 seven level that we have really never seen. We didn't see it around the war in Afghanistan. We didn't see it in Iraq after the first maybe two weeks of shock and awe. We stopped seeing that kind of massive coverage. And crucially what's been interesting in that coverage and very good, I would say, is that there has been an extraordinary level of uh, focus on humanizing the victims of the war. Uh, not the Russian conscript soldiers, of course, but the Ukrainian civilians and military forces uh, are being humanized in a way that we've never seen with, an, with a war around the world. That's all to the good and, and, it raises the question of extraordinary levels of double standards and racism and hypocrisy about why this war uh, 
where US forces are not, thankfully, not fighting directly, but the US is clearly supporting one side militarily with massive levels of military assistance, weapons, training, et cetera, we have not seen this kind of extraordinary humanization of the victims. And it calls into question why we've never seen it in any of the other wars. I think what's important is to keep the focus not on this isn't fair, we shouldn't be seeing this, but rather this is exactly how every war should be covered. This is how every set of refugees should be welcomed and should be covered in the press. You know, these are all the, the exemplars now of how it should work. And I think it's important that we keep that frame in mind. Coming back to the question of how do we get information to Russians, many Russians do have access to the internet through using, uh, I'm forgetting the uh, acronym, but those private ways of going around the-, the uh, VPNs. Shut it down, right, exactly. Um, plenty of Russians have access to that, and so they can get access to the information that's, that's happening in the US and elsewhere. And I think that's important as well. But the broader question of what is it going to take for there to be a Russian uh, um, initiative to challenge this war, it's going to take a great deal because the stakes are so high for individual Russians who are risking their freedom, who are risking their livelihoods, in some cases maybe risking their lives to do so. So I think that we have to sort of be realistic about what our capacity is. That's not going to be our job. The level of uh, suspicion of US media has a long history in Russia and it's not unjustified. You know, going back to the Cold War and how the mainstream media in this country uh, covered the Soviet Union, how it covered the collapse of the Soviet Union, how it covered the rise of a capitalist neoliberal Russia, all of that, you know, is not anything that we have to brag about. So I think that we have to be pretty um, humble, let's say, in terms of our capacity to provide, you know, some great media uh, source for, for Russians. I think it's a huge challenge that Russians face, but I'm afraid it's something they're going to have to face on their own. I don't see the U.S. being able to provide that. And I don't see the U.S. movements being able to either. Thank you so much for that. Oh, Can go I ahead. Yes. Of course, yeah. of course. Um, yeah, and hi everybody. Grateful to to be here and to my fellow panelists and Tope. Um, I mean, I, I I have similar things to to say as Phyllis, particularly what what she ended on, but also to say that um, you know there are folks. In, in Russia, well, I guess I want to emphasize that there are folks in Russia and in the region who are working to do the work of, of, of telling the truth about the war, which is part of, um, you know, they're, they're fighting for, they're fighting to advance democracy in Russia and in the region in general. So there's, there's some actually really interesting um, creative ways that folks in neighboring countries have been connecting with Russians. The, the, the US uh, radio program, This American Life, did a story about how Lithuanians have actually found way, who speak Russian have found ways to communicate with ordinary Russians by calling them on, on the phone and just talking to them about, about the news that they're seeing. Um, uh, so, so that kind of thing is happening in the region. And then there is really this incredibly, I mean, Phyllis spoke to it a bit, but this, this amazingly inspiring um, and, and heroic, uh, you know, community of journalists and or Russian journalists who, who uh, for years and years have been doing courageous work and continue to. I was, um, I mean, we might get into this, but I, I was kind of before the webinar, I was looking into, is it possible for what are independent uh, media or journalistic outfits in Russia that people here might want to donate to um, to support that kind of work? And an irony is actually because of the U.S. sanctions. Actually, I think that we're prevented from doing so. Um, it's also complicated by the the fact that these, for reasons that Phyllis said, these organizations don't want to be associated either ideologically or legally um, uh, with foreign agents um, in the US. So that that speaks to some of the complications there, but, but I think that we can be quite inspired by the work that people in Russia and neighboring countries are doing. Um, the, the other thing, the other point I wanted to make is just that, um, 
as we are moved by what is happening in, in Ukraine, um, it is an opportunity and I think a real call for those of us here to interrogate um, the ways that we get information. You know, I remember, uh, for example, when the US invaded Iraq, it was quite common. Um, it was sort of standard practice for the mainstream media outlets here to have embedded journalists, which were kind of um, necessarily broadcasting to the US what the US military wanted us to see. So there's, you know, it's, 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 it's good um, to, to see, and there's a kind of revelation, I think, to many people in this country, what repression and what restrictions on information and democracy look like in a Russian context. And we shouldn't leave it there. We should also take it as an opportunity to reflect upon our own society and its wars and um, in the ways that information is, is kind of channeled here as well. Wonderfully said, Corey. Thank you so much. Uh, this next question is for all three of you. I'll start with you. I'll ask you to start, John. Um, the progressive community seems divided on the provision of what Congress and the administration identify as defensive weapons to Ukraine. How do you feel about this, John? Well, I, I mean, I think the progressive community in the United States and to a lesser extent in Europe is divided not just about the nature of, of the weapons that are provided, I think there's a division over whether weapons should be provided at all uh, with some segments of the progressive community taking up um, uh, either a traditionally pacifist position or a position that has evolved over time that has uh, you know, been quite against US arms exports wherever they go, but especially toward, uh, toward into, the, into a, a live conflict. Um, but if we are sp talking specifically about the nature of the weapons that are being provided, um, you know, it, it, most weapons are dual use at some level. Um, and it, even, even the most defensive of, la of weapons, a shield is, is something that you use uh, to enable you to to use a spear. <laughs> I mean, it, that is the, the central contradiction of, uh, of military hardware. And, and it, it actually, the, the Chinese ideogram for contradiction is sword and spear, getting to the very nature of, of this problem of de delineating between what is an offensive and a defensive weapon. Um, but let's be honest, uh, for the most part, Ukraine, U Ukraine is not launching any kind of offensive activities. Yes, there have been reports of um, mysterious explosions that have taken place in Russia. There have been reports of uh, drones uh, that may be of Ukrainian origin um, uh, that have possibly entered Russian territory. It's unclear uh, the extent to which this is, you know, Ukrainian military activity. It's also possible that it is uh, Russian sabotage within, you know, done by anti-war activists within Russia. It's unclear, but regardless of, you know, the nature of these attacks, they are very small uh, collectively when compared with the offensive um, kind of onslaught that Russia is, has launched against Ukraine. So my own personal opinion is the Ukrainians have a right to self-defense um, and uh, it's, and, and it's not just defending that principle, I mean, because it's nice to say, well, they have the right to self-defense and, you know, they can pick up whatever rocks they want to defend themselves. Um, if you believe in the Ukrainian right to self-defense, well, they should have access to the means to that self-defense as well. However, you know, conflicted I personally am about the provision of U.S. military hardware in general, anywhere in the world, um, but I am committed to, you know, Ukrainian self-defense in this case. Um, can I just follow up quickly? Does that mean you think, John, that we should be providing them with weapons? Yes, I personally do. And, and believe me, this is not an easy position for me to take. Um, and I, I wrestle, <laughs> I have wrestled with this issue in the past, but part of it is informed by my experience during the Yugoslav wars when I actually very much supported an arms embargo and I did so on principled reasons. I mean, I, I felt that providing arms to the war in Yugoslavia actually 
uh, magnified the conflict. It was adding fuel to the fire. Um, but to be honest with you, that was an abstract position that I took. Um, and as I saw during the course of that war, in fact, what it meant was that the Serbians had access to as much weaponry as they wanted and the Bosnians had access to almost nothing. Uh, and what that meant on a practical basis was that Bosnians were dying uh, in the conflict and they did not have um, the ability to defend themselves. So I realized rather late in the game that I was wrong uh, and that an arms embargo in that situation really um, was uh, aiding asymmetrically the aggressor in the conflict. And I'm, I've tried to apply that kind of insight to, to this conflict as well. Context is really helpful. Uh, Phyllis, I was hoping you could opine on this as well. Well, thanks. And thanks for that, John. Um, I do have a different approach. I, I would note, I mean, ironically, you mentioned, you know, this rather cynically, I think, when you said that uh, Ukrainians have, would have the right if we didn't provide the weapons would have the right to use whatever rocks they wanted to defend themselves. That is a right we should note that is not granted to Palestinians to use rocks to defend themselves against tanks that we pay for and provide. So there is a question here of why this war, et cetera. My own view is that the US should not be providing any more weapons, uh, should not be providing weapons at all. I didn't support the earlier ones. I don't support the new Twenty and a half billion dollars that the that the Biden administration has just proposed within a thirty three billion dollar uh, uh, supplemental grant of aid to Ukraine. Um, I'm not, at least at this stage, calling for a global arms embargo against Ukraine. Uh, I think that uh, you know other governments and other people's movements will make decisions about the impact of weapons from their country going to Ukraine. But I think the problem for me in, in terms of uh, seeing this, yes, as a situation on the, in, the, in the war on the ground, there is no question in my mind, and I think most of us agree, that Russia is the aggressor. Uh, there is another war, if you will, as, as Professor Richard Falk describes it, that's one war, the other war being waged in, in Yugoslavia, uh, sorry, not in Yugoslavia, in, uh, uh, in Ukraine at this time, is a geopolitical war in which the United States and Russia are facing off. And the United States, by many accounts, is the aggressor in that war in a much longer process. That's not the ground war. That's the ideological war that's, that's underway, economic, et cetera. But in the context of the ground war, there is no question that Russia is the aggressor. And I do think that Ukrainians have the right of self-defense. I don't think that means that the United States, the most powerful, and militarily and economically most powerful country in the world should be coming in as a partisan in that war, which we have done. The US is a part of that war. And I think to say that for a change, the US is coming in on the right side is a very dangerous uh, reality because it, we know from experience what happens when the US goes to war. It involves the militarization as we're now seeing across Europe, the expansion of NATO, the, the notion of NATO as a defensive uh, uh, military alliance has never been true since 1991 at least when the whole question of what is NATO uh, was up for grabs. And instead of saying NATO was designed to challenge the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union is no more, NATO should dissolve itself, declare victory and go home. Instead of that, NATO became an offensive out of region power where it's proceeded to go to war in 1999 in Kosovo, in 2011 in uh, Libya, in 2003 in Iraq, in 2001 in Afghanistan. So the notion of NATO as a defensive reality has simply not been the case at least for, for several decades. In that context, we know what happens as a result of the US providing weapons. It's going to be a huge bonanza, already is, for the corporations that get already half of the US uh, military budget. We know that the, uh, the billions of dollars that are now being added to the, the, the budget is objectively taking money away, not only for social programs that are desperately needed in this country and around the world, but also uh, taking it away from diplomacy. 
the, the entire budget this year of the State Department is something like, um, I'm just, is, is um, about $34 billion. The US is now proposing to give $33 billion for war in Ukraine. That means that the State Department remains completely underfunded. It was hollowed out during the years of the, uh, of the, the uh, Trump administration and has not been rebuilt. We don't have even the diplomats that we need to carry out aggressive diplomacy that's needed to help bring an end to this war. I'm afraid that by spending these billions on expanding the war, we're going to see greater militarization around the world. Certainly it's already emerging in, across Europe and in Japan and elsewhere. And we're going to see a continuation of this war that's going to lead to more Ukrainians dying and more, more young Russian recruits dying as well. There's already been over 15,000 that have been killed, uh, Russians that we're talking about, not Ukrainians. So I think that it is not in the interest of a diplomatic solution that we all claim to support to be flooding the, the country with, with this amount of money. The GDP, the gross domestic product of Ukraine in 2020, which was the last available year, was $155 billion. Adding another 33 billion to that, it's, it's not even clear that Ukraine has the capacity to absorb all of that, except in the form of weapons. And I think that expanding this, uh, this war militarily is not in the interest of forcing a level of diplomacy that is yet escaping us, that is yet outside of our reach. That needs to be the focus. And I don't think that billions more for weapons accomplishes that. Thank you so much for that, Phyllis. Curry, I'd like to hear your perspective on this. And there's a really interesting kind of back and forth happening here. I mean, I think there's a general kind of reticence about the prospect of us, by us, I mean, the US providing weapons to uh, the Ukrainians, um, but also an acknowledgement of the fact that they should be able to defend themselves, right? So it's a really difficult issue to parse here. I was wondering how you're sort of weighing this and what your conclusions are. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one reason why I think that this conversation is really important, you know, and I really, I really appreciate what john is saying and appreciate the kind of I mean that kind of. Um, I don't know the the difficulty and the 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 conflicted you know. Um, you know feelings I think of all of us have you know on, on in, in different ways. Um, you know, like I appreciate John, your your articulation of that, um, uh, and and I, you know, I I have arrived at a different position. Um, also, you know, I I also agree with the idea that I'm I'm not for calling for an arms embargo, and I do believe in the 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 right of um, Ukrainians for self defense, but I, I guess what I'll what I'll say that um, maybe is is a, a little different is that. You know, we we have that sentiment. You know, we have sympathies with the people of Ukraine, um, and I think that we should not assume that the U.S. government is doing what it's doing because it has the same exact sympathies. You know, um, it may appear so. <laughs> you know, like we might say, oh, you know, this is so hor horrific what what what's happening to Ukraine, and then the U.S. steps in and says, well, we've got this weapons package, and. We shouldn't assume that those are motivated by the same, that they're driven by the same uh, motivations. Um, and so, you know, when I, I'll just name a couple of things that, that, are, that are deeply concerning. One is that for the US, I think this is an opportunity to um, having identified Russia for, you know, at least two decades as a potential challenge or rival to US power in the world, this is an opportunity to see a weaker Russia emerge um, uh, from this, you know, and if Ukraine happens to be the context for that to happen, then 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 so be it. Um, from from you know, as far as Washington is concerned, the other thing, and this gets at some of the the bigger, broader um, regional and geopolitical kind of structural things that Phyllis spoke to, you know, thirty three billion dollars is not a gift; it's an investment. I mean, when we consider the, the, the top recipients of US aid around the world and the, the expectation of what the US expects, you know, as part of that relationship, when, when the US gives aid to Israel, for example, 
there's an or, or to Saudi Arabia or to Egypt. There's an understanding of what role those states are going to play in that region and its alignment with U.S. interests. That is, you know, that's it's, a, it's more or less an, an open conversation actually in Washington. And frankly, you know, when, when Zelensky talks too about imagining a post a, a Ukraine after this war, and he says it's going to look like Israel. I mean, I, I think I think I think he's signaling a number of things with that, but certainly the expectation that Ukraine and actually a number of states will be um, more. Uh, vocal, <laughs> more adamant in the kind of advancing a certain set of interests um, that the U.S. supports, and and not just more vocal, but armed to um, to assert those things. I think that's the calculation in Washington, um, and that's that's deeply troubling. It's really moving. If if the if the hope is that by uh, sending weapons, it can lead to demilitarization. I'm afraid it's the opposite. Appreciate that, Curry. Um, John, I was wondering if you had any sort of final words on this before we move forward. Well, you know, I, I remember conversations I had with folks at the American Friends Service Committee back in the 19, late 1980s. And AFSC, of course, is a Quaker organization um, and therefore very much aligned with pacifist, uh, robust pacifist, I should say, positions. Uh, and yet there was a very strong conversation at that time about whether we could support um, armed liberation movements. And uh, there were a lot of us in the organization said, look, you know, we believe uh, in nonviolence. We believe in demilitarization. We're very much against US military budget, et cetera. But, um, you know, in some cases, if people come together, they feel they need to use arms for the purpose of liberation. Now, this was, of course, a different kind of conversation than we're having now, but I'm reminded of it because it was a similar kind of struggle of dealing with one's values, which were very much aligned with demilitarization and the realities of the world, uh, which were very different from say, you know, the conversations taking place in Northampton, Massachusetts, or you know, Tempe, Arizona. Um, and you know, I, if there were a country like Austria that was providing $33 billion worth of military assistance to Ukraine, I would say, hey, of course, United States, we don't need to have a, a, a dog in that game, as James Baker famously said about our uh, approach to Yugoslavia back in the 1990s. We can afford to stand back, um, but that's not the case. Uh, and yes, I totally agree with Phyllis and Korea about concerns about uh, militariz further militarization of, of, of our society, uh, the, the consequences of military aid and the strings attached to them. I don't, however, see that there is a necessary relationship, unfortunately, between provision of aid and the diplomatic alternatives. Uh, because that somehow implies that there's a robust diplomatic effort underway that uh, Russia is all behind. Um, as I mentioned, you know, th there was some momentum at the end of March. Um, Ukraine released its 10 points, which included neutrality. Um, Russia continues to push its maximalist agenda, maybe not as maximalist as it was at the beginning, since it obviously failed to achieve its initial objectives, but maximalist in terms of territorial acquisition, uh, maximalist in terms of, uh, of basically population transfer. I mean, this is, <laughs> we're not only talking about war crimes in terms of killing of civilians, um, but we're talking about a really unbelievable uh, relocation of Ukrainians from areas of Mariupol in southern Ukraine and in the Donbass against their will to areas inside Russia, basically echoing the population transfers that took place under Stalin during the Soviet period. Um, these are, these go beyond, all of this goes beyond kind of quote unquote normal, you know, wartime activities. Um, so I do not see Russia as at this point supporting uh, in any meaningful way diplomacy. And so I do think that it is um, unfortunate, but true that the provision of military assistance by the United States and other countries uh, 
um, is not at the moment undercutting a diplomatic initiative. Uh, I'm hoping that in fact, and God knows I do not like this relationship, but I'm hoping that um, some form of military stalemate will push the Putin administration to be, um, shall we say, more compromising at the negotiating table. Again, I do not like to say that because I do not like to push this relationship between uh, aggression and eventual peace negotiations. But when dealing with the current Russian position, I'm unfortunately having to take that view. Phyllis, I'd love to get your view on this, especially the notion that the kind of provision of weapons to Ukrainians might actually push this crisis in the direction of diplomacy. It's a really interesting, interesting perspective. I, I appreciate John's view on that. I, unfortunately, I don't think that it works that way. I think the notion that Russia will be more likely to negotiate with a U.S. backed force, and that's what we have to recognize is negotiations with Ukraine is all about. It's negotiating with the US and NATO through Ukraine. The notion that that's going to be more likely as a result of a, a massive, this is really $33 billion is really massive escalation in US involvement in the war. I, I think that's, it's quite the opposite. I'm afraid that it's going to make diplomacy even more difficult, that Russia is going to feel even more cornered and lash out. And when we're talking about nuclear armed protagonists here, any possibility, and I think it's not likely, but it's not zero. And if it's anything other than zero, to me, that's a huge consideration in looking at the threats of a, a new level of escalation. The other thing I think is that's so important for us to, to keep in mind, no one in Congress is saying a word about the consequences of spending $33 billion suddenly even beyond the $800, million, uh, $800 billion uh, um, military budget that's on call for next year. And that, that just if we look at the 20 billion, not even the whole 33 billion, because it's not all for military, most of it is, $20 billion of it is aimed at direct military contracts, mainly to US military contractors. You know, Places like Boeing are going to make a killing in all ways on these, uh, on these budget escalations, that $20 billion would also pay for 2.4 public housing units for a year. It would pay for 558,000 jobs at $15 an hour with benefits for a year. It could get healthcare for five point, uh, sorry, 6.9 million children across this country. And that's just a sample of what that same $20 billion could be used for. So it's not as if this is just $20 billion kind of floating around the world that, well, why not? You know, This is a, a just cause. And the final thing I wanna say, just in response to, to John's earlier point about his conversations with AFSC, I had many conversations like that 10 years earlier during the Vietnam era, as opposed to the Central America era, um, where we did support the Vietnamese and their right to fight back. Certainly we weren't in any position to provide military support. Uh, God forbid that that should have been sort of on the, on the agenda, but we supported their military forces. We wanted the Vietnamese to win the war. And in that context, I think what was important, which I don't think is the case here, is that it wasn't only a matter of the question of self-determination and they, they have a right to, to their own country we also supported the social program they were trying to build. And they did build, it didn't last very long, unfortunately, as we know in Vietnam, the same has been true in, in other countries. But at the time that they were fighting, the kind of new society they were talking about building with equality economically, equality for women, all of those things for, for socialism, these were all things that we supported. And that was part of the reason for supporting even a, a, a military component of these struggles. That was true in Central America. It was true in South Africa and the anti-apartheid struggle. In all of those regions, it was because we supported what the other side was fighting for. I understand that Ukrainians are fighting for survival as a, an independent country. And that's an important thing for sure. That's how the world is organized is in, in nation states. But to me, that's not the same. What, what 
Ukraine was before, and what Zelensky says it's going to be after only on steroids, if we use his example of we want to be like Israel, and he made these specific comparisons to we should be expecting to see armed civilians and our soldiers in every movie theater and every supermarket. That was Zelensky's description of what post-war Ukraine should look like. I'm not interested in creating that. So it's a different situation, I think, when you actually support what they're trying to build as opposed to you support their right to fight back against an oppression such as they're facing in, in, uh, with the Russian invasion and occupation, but they're not the same thing. So I think that's where we, we come down to different conclusions about this $20 billion of military and $13 billion more in other kinds of assistance to Ukraine. Thank you, Phyllis. I see, John, you have your, your hand up. Just a quick comment on, on the question of social program. I mean, I, I have two kind of responses to that. One, to a certain extent, social program is not really relevant. I mean, if you're talking about a country that's been invaded and uh, is fighting for its survival, I mean, what social program the current government imagines for the country, it, it shouldn't really determine whether we support it or not. What we're supporting is its survival. But on the question of social program, I mean, uh, I prefer to think, look, the, the, Zelensky is basically a libertarian from a libertarian party. Not my cup of tea necessarily, um, better than of course, right-wing fascists, uh, not as good in my opinion as democratic socialists, but anyway, libertarians. It's what he is, it's what their program is. But in terms of a vision of where Ukraine is gonna, is heading, okay, Israel, I mean, there are a lot of connotations when you say Israel. I think what Zelensky meant was a, a, a country that's in some sense under siege from his point of view. But the, the end point for Ukraine is today the same as it was prior to the invasion, that's to be a member of the European Union. And that's something I can get behind. Um, and, and, okay. NATO. and NATO, he wanted to be in NATO. But that's largely off the- I agree, the but, right but it is a goal. It is a goal. It's not on the table right now. Well, I mean, honestly, yeah. Phyllis, if you've been invaded, you know, to, to be part of an alliance that provides for collective self-defense, it's hard not to be enthusiastic about that. And it's understandable why Sweden and Finland, who, you know, hitherto were not enthusiastic about joining NATO, suddenly are more enthusiastic. Um, and again, I mean, I'm not, I, I, I've spent 25 years arguing that NATO is, is anachronistic, that we should have been building other security frameworks or strengthening the, the OSCE. I wrote a piece in 1996 about the dangers of, of NATO expansion that talked specifically about how it would divide Ukraine. In 1996, I wrote this. I don't disagree with anything I wrote back then. However, I can understand at this point uh, after an invasion why NATO suddenly looks more attractive than it did before. But on the question of social program, you know, uh, the EU and membership for Ukraine in the EU seems to me like a, a pretty good thing. And when we compare it to what the social program is of Putin and his, you know, klepto oligarchs, <clears throat> well, that's not a social program I'm at any level in support of. Question is, you know, what might things evolve to inside Russia? But I do know that if Russia were to take over Ukraine and apply its model to the country, um, we would have suddenly a social system that I would find repugnant. And unfortunately that would be a piece of sorts. And that's not the piece that I, I would accept um, because that's, you know, that's certainly one possible scenario endpoint for this conflict in which we get peace but it's a peace that's bought at the expense of Ukrainian sovereignty, the existence of uh, potentially Ukrainian culture, and at the expense of a lot of Ukrainians and frankly, Russian soldiers as well, who have died uh, as a result of this peace that's been imposed on the country. This has been a great back and forth principled 
interesting, uh, and I've learned a great deal. Uh, before we move ahead, I, Curry, do you have anything you'd like to add before we pivot to the next topic? Sure, just a, um, a quick thing. I also really appreciate this exchange. I, I would say, you know, I think that um, one of the, the so, so, so I hear John saying, look, I know what NATO is, I know what the history is, I know how these things work. And yet here we are, you know, um, and I don't, I don't, you know, a, 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 you know, we know what a stalemate means, you know, I mean, the word is, the word doesn't speak to the, re I mean, the, the word stalemate implies that there's a sort of, um, you know, stuckness, but actually the stuckness flows from bloodshed that can't get past an impasse. So, so we're, you know, it, in, in, in those circumstances, what feels like the uh, least worst thing or the best uh, option, you know, I, I, I understand that. And, and also, you know, as Phyllis and I argue for demilitarization and for stepping back and looking at the bigger picture, I know that there's something that's, that's kind of dissatisfying to people about that who are concerned with the immediate catastrophe unfolding, you know, in, in, in Ukraine, that's real. Um, and I guess I, one thing I wanted to just put on the table is one of the things that makes this so difficult is that it, it, it feels like we are largely commenting on the actions of forces well beyond our control and that we spend a lot of time critiquing and resisting. We're talking about states, you know, the Russian state, NATO, the US state. Um, and one thing that is, largely missing um, and, and that I think that we, one of the key takeaways I think from this entire experience has to be a commitment to rebuilding a global movement against war in, in general so that popular resistance and popular uh, power is a factor in this whole thing. So it isn't just which, you know, which state do you, uh, do, who's, uh, which, which efforts by which state do you hope prevails, you know, um, uh, in this thing, but actually organized anti-war forces um, around the world actually can be uh, a, a factor to support, to invest in, to commit to, to build, um, et cetera, um, so, that, so that we can, we can have a, a popular intervention. And I'll, you know, one, um, you know, I'll take exception with one thing that John said, which was about the nature, you know, the nature of this invasion. And I appreciate the, you know, <laughs> you know how, how indescribably violent and horrendous it is. Um, but the notion that this level of displacement is beyond the bounds of normal warfare, like I'm, 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 I'm sorry to say that it is profoundly normal for millions of people around the world to be displaced. I mean, what's, what's happening in Ukraine in this amount of weeks at this scale, yes, is, is, is catastrophic. But this is a, you know, when I think about the, the, the when I think about what's happening in Ethiopia uh, right now, for example, among many, many other places, when I think about places like Palestine, which have had at this point, several generations of displaced um, refugees, it, it, it is, it is among other things, points to the need to really reconstruct the kind of popular anti-war um, resistance that emerged actually on the eve of the US invasion of Iraq in 2003, um, but of course in a much more sustained way because you know, I, I think that there's, there's been, we, we've, we've lost that. That needs to be rebuilt and um, I think rebuilt informed by, um, informed by the violence and the crises of, of, of various states, you know, in regions uh, uh, around the world. It's not enough to have this either we oppose US violence or we oppose Russian violence. There's, there's, when we take a step back and look at war and militarism shaping the reality for many, many people around the globe, it means that we need to, to build something from the bottom up that takes this on and intervenes in a different way. Thanks, Corey. I'd like to pick up that thread. Uh, your last point about sort of a mass response to this, you know, people power. Um, and John, I'd like to ask you, 
I think we all on this sort of call want diplomacy. What are concrete ways that ordinary citizens can uh, support diplomacy, John? Yeah, that's a tough question. And I, before I answer your specific question, because I thought you were going to go in a different direction, because there was sure. a question in the Q and A about about um, people on the ground in Ukraine uh, responding, and in ways that were not militaristic. Um, and and I'll I'll just say that there are uh, and there have been kind of Gene Sharp type um, approaches by people on the ground in Ukraine resisting Russian authority. Um, you know, for instance. Uh, just recently, um, the Russians in, on May 1st imposed the ruble on Kherson, the only kind of city, major city that they um, that they uh, took over, and um, and a real indication that they have some intention of consolidating political and administrative control over the southern uh, tier. Um, but many people in that city have just said, well, you know, we're just going to immediately uh, turn our uh, rubles into Ukrainian currency. Uh, we're not going to. We're not going to accept Russian ruble here. And another way of basically rejecting Russian authority on the ground. It's not military, I mean, although there's plenty of uh, military responses as well. But as to your question, uh, Tope, um, of what uh, people can do to support diplomacy. Um, and, you know, even in the best of circumstances, it is hard for, for citizens to become involved in diplomacy. Of course, we've had citizen diplomacy and a rich tradition of that, delegations going to countries that are considered to be adversaries of the United States um, to meet with people, to build bridges. And, and you know, that's, there's a proud tradition. And I, I hope that we can continue that with Russia um, and that we can, continue to emphasize that this is a war that is promulgated by the Russian government. And it is not the Russian people who, I mean, many of them may support the war, but the Russian people aren't necessarily connected to this war. Uh, we cannot assume that all Russians support this war, even though the you know, popularity rating for Putin himself has, has risen. Um, thousands and thousands of Russians have protested against this war and otherwise demonstrated their um, their disgust for what is going on here. Um, reaching out to those folks, reaching out to whether they're within Russia or outside of Russia, as far as I'm concerned, is part of citizen diplomacy. It's building up people power against um, you know, the, the powers that are uh, pushing war, uh, primarily in Moscow, but elsewhere as well. Um, and. Uh, I think that's the most effective, uh, effective kind of diplomatic effort we can do. Of course, we can continue to support refugees, and and you know, as Curie pointed out, it's not just Ukrainian refugees who are who are circulating around the world. So you know, we have to be even-handed uh, in our approach to to refugees and opening our doors, not just to folks from Ukraine, um, but. That is another uh, way of being diplomatic, of engaging in the, the process of diplomacy on a very, very one-to-one -one basis um, and otherwise supporting humanitarian efforts. Um, the actual face-to-face -face of Ukrainian you know, government officials and Russian government officials, ah, not so easy to influence. Of course, we can continue to press our government to support diplomacy in general. Um, even as we send arms, uh, even as we, you know, say mean things about the Russians, we can still, as as a U.S. government, uh, support diplomatic efforts, give our support for other third-party negotiators who, frankly, because of U.S. history, could be far more effective in bringing the two sides together. Whether the, that might be the Turks, um, it might be, you know, uh, the Bulgarians. I mean, it could be other folks from the region. Um, but it's absolutely critical for the United States to whatever way we can build that space and, uh, and expand that space for diplomacy. And it is our job as U.S. citizens to encourage our government to do that. Thank you, John. Phyllis, I was wondering if you had some words on this. I do. I agree with, with most of John's proposals of what, what needs to happen, but I would add a few other things. I think that the militarization of US foreign policy has been a very serious problem for at least the last 20 years and before that to a significant degree as well. 
And I think that's our obligation to push. When we look at the budgets, you know, Martin Luther King taught us that budgets are moral documents. And our moral commitment right now is pretty much tanking in this country, in my view. When we look at the budgets, we're looking at a budget of $35 billion for the entire State Department. When we're throwing $33 billion without a hint of investigation or oversight by Congress at a war, at one particular war, it's ensuring, it's ensuring that we're not gonna have the diplomatic clout to make anything happen, like the revitalization of the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. That's who should be organizing diplomacy. This is a, an organization that is a political and diplomatic organization, not a military organization like NATO, that is charged with maintaining peace and human rights across all of Europe. And both Russia and Ukraine and all of Western Europe and all of the rest of Europe are all members of it. Of course, so is Canada and the US who seem to think that they should be, you know, have the right to be part of every uh, um, regional area, every regional organization, whether they happen to be in that region or not. But okay, it involves everybody in Europe. There's a, a political basis there to say, oh, that's who should maybe be in charge here. The US is facing a scenario which we've been seeing dramatically rising over recent decades where when somebody in Congress wants to do something good somewhere, I remember talking to this one member of Congress a few years ago who said, you know, I was on a delegation in several African countries and in one place in particular, I think he was talking about Cameroon, I don't quite remember. Um, he said, you know, we spent a day in a, uh, a small town and what was clear was there was a lot of potential for massive improvement of people's lives if they could get more access to fresh water and they needed to dig a well and didn't have whatever it is that hydrologists need to dig a well, whatever the equipment was. And it was, it was several tens of thousands of dollars. It was like, it was chump change. It was absolute chump change in Congress. And he tried to get it through some committee and they were like, no, we don't have any money for that. Go talk to the Pentagon. And he was like, what? Why would I go talk to the Pentagon? Because they have the money. And he went and he talked to somebody in the congressional liaison's office at the Pentagon who said, oh yeah, we could do that, no problem. And full stop, the, the well was dug, yay, everybody cheered the US military. And what happens? The military takes over the decision-making about what's a legitimate political slash diplomatic initiative and what isn't. That's what we're looking at here again. You know, it's not to say that I'm such a fan of how US diplomacy has always worked. Sometimes it's been pretty crummy and it has served as a force multiplier, that's the Pentagon's language, for, uh, uh, for, for Pentagon initiatives. You know, why is it that in Ukraine, uh, sorry, why is it that in Afghanistan, you know, we have this intersection of military and diplomatic initiatives? It's because the military has all the money. So if we're giving $20 billion to Congress is going to give it to the Defense Department to pay out to military contractors so they can build more bombs and more warplanes and more weapons and more ammunition and more tanks and send all that to Ukraine and cheering them on. At the same time, we're allowing the hollowing out of the, of, of the State Department, including its budget and its staff, to stand. We're allowing that to be incapable of doing anything. And that's a huge problem, not only for today, where it's a problem for the whole world, but also in the future where we can see it getting worse. You know, So I think that these are the kinds of things that we have to take very seriously. And I absolutely understand why people in Ukraine are demanding, as President Zelensky does, urging, crying for US military support. We've seen this before. We saw it in, uh, in, in, uh, in Libya. We saw it in Syria, where people, not just the military, not just officials, people called out and wanted US military support. And we were opposed to it because we understood what the consequences would be. And it's horrifying to say to somebody who is fighting for their lives, we want your military support. And we're like, we really don't think it's, it's gonna work. You know, the fact that people are desperate makes it understandable 
why they're desperate for military weapons. And those of us who are privileged to be outside of that desperation also have an obligation to figure out as best we can what's going to have a more dangerous impact later. And to say, we're so sorry, but it can't happen that way. And we've done that before. We've done it, many of us are doing it now for Ukraine. It's never easy. It's always painful. It doesn't mean we're necessarily gonna be right every single time, but we have to make the best judgment we can, not only looking at today, when Ukrainians are dying and Russian soldiers are dying and far too many people are dying to say, we don't think that sending $20 billion more weapons is going to save more lives. We understand why you're desperate and calling out for it, but we're going to say, no, we're sorry. And that's an awful position to be in. But I think it's the more principled one, ultimately, when we look at how diplomacy is going to have any chance of replacing a military conflict. Kree, that's really great. Thank you, Phyllis. And Kree, I'd like you to weigh in as well, and especially on this kind of point that Phyllis seems to be making about the kind of longitudinal impact of the decisions we make about sort of arming Ukrainians. You know, there's, I think Phyllis is arguing that we have to think not only about what's happening now, but what the ramifications of this policy might be. Of course, you have to also balance that with the horrific images we continue to see in our television screens and our computer screens of the carnage and suffering that's happening in Ukraine, um, which is one reason why a lot of people, I think, support um, arming Ukrainians. Uh, so, and then of course, there's the original question I asked, which is about diplomacy and how we might support, which is to connect to a point that you made before, Curry, about sort of people-powered diplomacy. I was wondering what you're thinking as we discuss all of these various things. Yeah, I mean, just just on the the point about looking at the long term, I just think that's extremely important because this is, um, you know, it's it's funny. Like Phil and I were talking the other day about how um, during uh, one of the one of the um, Gulf Wars, uh, maybe both, um, or you know, the, the various Gulf Wars that. There was something, a, a term that that um, progressives and critics of the war call, coined um, called the CNN effect. You know, like the the impact of having twenty four seven kind of news coverage of um, a war, and a, not just coverage, but a certain kind of coverage, um, and the way that that shaped the understandings that those viewing that coverage had of what was even possible um, and how, you know, Phyllis said today, we can call it the Twitter effect, you know, um, and, and it's true. There's a, there's a kind of both pacing and type of coverage that I think lend themselves to, oh my goodness, there's an immediate crisis, an immediate threat, and only a massive superpower can step in and intervene and stop this. Um, and therefore, you know, maybe in the short term, this, you know, supporting uh, U.S. Um, intervention of various kinds, sanctions, you know, weapons, uh, et cetera, you know, pe people who, not, none of us, but there are people who have wanted no-fly zones, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll make one kind of big point and then unfairly move away from it, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big thing that I hope people consider. I think that there's actually, I think that there's kind of this fantasy that is concocted in the US that horrendous things can be stopped by a global superpower. Um, and it is, it's a belief that, that um, I was going to say those of us who grew up in this country, but I think many people around the world actually have come into this understanding that if the United States steps in, it can be the superhero to to prevent horrendous things. And I just, I just, I, I'm sorry, I don't think that that's true. Um, I don't think that that's that's played out historically. I don't think that that's true now. Um, uh, this is a horrific, horrific moment of of violence, you know, um, and. I understand, you know, the kind of helplessness with which many of us watch it. And without 
for a moment minimizing it and rather in the interest of deepening our understanding of it so that we can do more, so that we can build more robust responses, I invite folks to consider, and you know, folks who are viewing this will already know that many of us have felt a certain helplessness as we watched what happened in Syria, as we watched what happened in Somalia, and et cetera, et cetera. So this again, there's a there's a there's a need to to build something different. This isn't working um, for any of the purposes that that we uh, have. But the other thing, and this is, I think, the, the, the point, you know, embedded in your question is I, I actually I urge folks to consider that there is no such thing as the short term. You, you know what I mean? Like, like of course there are there are short term. <laughs> Yeah, of course, there are things that happen in the short term, but all of these have long term implications. Thirty three billion dollars is not a short term. I mean, it, 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 Washington is acting with an eye to the future, you know, and I think that we have to um, uh, understand and, and, and um, appreciate that. Just in terms of diplomacy, the, the, the one thing to say, and I'm sorry to say it, is, you know, when we think about I mean, you know, as John pointed out, Russia at the moment, it doesn't <laughs> seem interested in, in a diplomatic solution. Um, you know, when it comes to the US side of the equation, I'm sorry to say that um, I think it's even worse than we tend to acknowledge uh, in terms of the role that the US is playing. It, 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 this, is, this is not a voice for, for diplomacy. Um, and that includes in a big way, you know, the civilians who are the, the, the you know, the, fo the folks who just went to Ukraine we're not there to advocate diplomacy. They were there as part of the overall effort. I'm talking about the, the, the congressional delegation as part of the, the, the overall effort that is primarily at the moment um, arming Ukraine. You know, when the president of the country goes to a neighboring country and says, this, this Putin, this guy can't stay in power, that's not advancing diplomacy. You, you know what I mean? Um, and the other thing is actually, you know, when I think about like what the State Department is doing, um, you know, because Phyllis is, is talking about the hollowing out of the State Department and, it, and to say it's a, it's a certain kind of hollowing out. I mean, you know, it's certain people, <laughs> certain offices are eliminated and others are supported. Um, and, uh, and the leaders of the State Department are saying that it's not that they're not doing diplomacy, they're doing a certain kind of diplomacy. And so I remember early on, um, you know, days into the invasion, I, I, I can't remember the date, but, um, you know, the Secretary of State, uh, Antony Blinken, was was meeting with uh, one of his counterparts in the United Arab Emirates. And, you know, he tweeted about it and said, I met with this person from the UAE and, you know, we're discussing what Ukraine and how terrible this is and, you know, what we can do. And it's like, okay, so, so what you're actually doing is taking the opportunity of the Russian invasion of Ukraine to advance the notion that this US ally with, with, you know, which on its own and also with the extensive collaboration of the United States is violating human rights in Yemen, you're advancing the notion that this is somehow a partner in uh, an order that supports human rights. So it's, it's not just not advancing a diplomatic solution to um, this crisis, it's actually using the tools of diplomacy to really advance this overall more militarized future um, and, and honestly give cover to countries that are doing very similar things to what Russia is doing uh, in Ukraine. So to, to go back to the original question around, you know, what do we do to support diplomacy? I think that it's on us to demand a certain kind of, um, you know, actions from the US government and to resist um, other actions and, and frankly, you know, most of what it's doing now. Thanks so much, Curry. Um, so another sort of major topic here, uh, one thing that a lot of people are thinking about is the kind of crisis around democracy. It seems as if we're living in a moment where democracy isn't as sort of strong and seemingly as viable as it has been in the past. Uh, John, I want to start with you. Is there any way we can use this crisis uh, to promote democratic developments in, in Russia? Uh, always, you're, you're picking the hard ones, Tope. <laughs> um, I, before I answer that, I just want to say two quick things about what Phyllis and Curry were saying. One is, this is not just the United States. I mean, I know we live in the United States, 
we're Americans. But this is, it's not just the United States is supplying aid to Ukraine or, or standing with Ukraine. I mean, this is almost all of Europe um, and a good chunk of the rest of the world, though. I just wrote a piece a couple of weeks ago about why large stretches of the global south, in fact, are not <laughs> standing with Ukraine. But I do want to try to get us away from this kind of America-centric uh, perspective, because it, it, it isn't all about us and about our imperial legacy. Um, and second is, you know, yeah, the, there are reasons why military contractors are rejoicing at the prospect of more military sales. But I do not see the, Bush, the Biden administration as being particularly enthusiastic about this war continuing. Um, it has a lot of very negative impacts on the US economy, as well as Biden's domestic program. Um, and, you know, it's, it's an, an unbelievable tragedy that we get bipartisan support for a $33 billion package for Ukraine and we can't get through Build Back Better. Um, and suddenly all of the Republicans' concerns about inflation, et cetera, go out the window when we're talking about a military package. So that's a, an, an, an enduring frustration. But to your question, Tope, about democracy, um, you know, democracy has never been a particularly robust element in Russian society. I mean, you, you had a brief experiment with, with democracy prior to the revolution in 1917. You had uh, somewhat longer, but still in the global scheme of things, a pretty brief uh, experiment with democracy after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, and you know, the United States, you could argue, was never particularly interested in, in any authentic democracy in Russia, more interested in kind of seeing a particular economic program uh, imposed or arise within uh, post-Soviet society. So those institutions never became particularly strong. And unfortunately, where they did exist, they became associated with precisely this neoliberal economic experiment so that large portions of the Russian population were like, well, hey, why should we uh, embrace democracy if it's associated with the continual immiseration of the population, including me? <laughs> you know, so you can understand why democracy didn't you know, take very, did not uh, become rooted in Russia uh, during the Yeltsin period. At this stage uh, with Putin, Putin's been in power since 1999. Uh, he has increasingly consolidated his power at the expense of democratic institutions. Uh, the invasion has pushed tens of thousands of people out of the country who might be considered the strongest advocates for some kind of change within the country. He's imprisoned plenty of opposition leaders, killed several of them as well. Um, in that kind of situation, there's not a whole lot of options available uh, for the Russians themselves, much less what we, whether you're talking about me and you, Tope, or about progressive community or about the United States, not a whole lot we can do other than stand with folks uh, who want to create a non-Putin space. I mean, not even talking anti-Putin space, I'm talking a non-Putin space, some kind of a space within Russian society that is not in the control of Vladimir Putin and his rich minions. Um, and you're right, uh, you, you started by saying this is a, a period of time in which democracy seems to be on its back foot. So it's not just Russia. When Vladimir Putin you know, asserts his illiberal philosophy, he's not just saying, dude, it's me and my philosophy and I don't really care whether you like it or not. He is riding a wave of illiberalism uh, around the world. He has friends in high places, whether we're talking about Jair Bolsonaro or we're talking about Xi Jinping, he's got the wind at his back. Um, and, uh, and he has done whatever he can to encourage that, supporting you know, illiberal figures throughout Europe and elsewhere in the world, including Donald Trump in this country. Um, so uh, I do think that addressing illiberalism in Russia is in part going to the heart of the problem we face today. If we can make change there, and when I say we, I'm not really talking about me and you, Tope, and I'm not talking about the US government. I'm really talking about 
uh, those of us who support democracy hand in hand with folks in Russia who support democracy or this non-Putin space that I'm talking about, then we've kind of cracked uh, the hardest nut as far as I'm concerned. Um, a, a place where illiberalism has taken root and has become kind of the epicenter of, you know, uh, I won't call, talk about it in civilizational terms, I'll simply say a political project that uh, has advanced and has gained considerable international support. So the stakes are very high and they go beyond the war in Ukraine. Thank you so much, John. I was, Phyllis, what do you think about this sort of topic of democracy in Russia and how we might support that? I think it's a very tricky topic. And I think we have to be very careful how we ask the questions. I think it's the wrong question, Tope. I will say that. Okay. To start with <laughs> sure. how can we somehow in the US, whether the government, people, movements, support democracy in Russia? First, I think the question is, how do we build democracy here? Yeah. I think we have a serious democratic deficit here. I don't like the term illiberal. It sounds, I, I don't know, to me, it sounds created. It's, uh, I, I don't know exactly what else. It's, in some cases, it looks like fascism. In other cases, it looks like neoliberal democracy and is still as anti-human rights and anti-democratic as anything else. So I don't know what term is the best. I don't know that there's any one term, but I do think that the question of what can we, what can we learn from the struggle over Ukraine, the struggle in this country about how to respond, the struggle over sending weapons or not, all of these questions, I think there are, uh, there are lessons to be, to be drawn out. I think that one clear lesson is that massive military spending in general doesn't work. And Ukraine emerges as a classic example of all the hundreds of billions of dollars the US has spent, our tax money, spent to create and build up NATO as an offensive global force in, in at least one case, actually taking on the role illegally, but who put that aside, uh, taking on the role of the United Nations Security Council in authorizing a war that being the 1999 war in Kosovo, where the US decided since we can't get the Security Council on our side, Russia will veto, we'll just not ask the Security Council and instead we'll ask the NATO High Command. And what a surprise, the NATO High Command said, yes, we think that a military re response is the, the appropriate thing. You know, We're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We're NATO, everything looks like it requires NATO intervention. So in this case, all those billions that have been spent could not prevent the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It didn't work. So I think that's a, a, a part of how we, have to, how we have to look at this question. I think that the challenge globally has to be, and I agree with John's point on this, the global question has to be, how do we build a global movement for democracy? How do we not only support, but be one with people struggling against Bolsonaro in, in, in Brazil, people struggling against Duterte in the Philippines, people struggling in, in all of these countries and in the United States. You know, the notion that Trump's, victory, Trump's defeat was somehow a victory for, for democracy and that Trumpism disappeared with Trump, boy, is that a fallacy. You know, we have so much work to do here we can't forget that almost half the voters in this country voted for Trump and still support Trump. That's a huge challenge to us. Yes, I'm grateful that, you know, I was relieved when we got Biden instead, but the notion that this is now all okay and, and it's just a matter of, you know, let's now just look forward and not worry about what happened so far. We can't do that. We can't afford to take that risk. You know, Trump or his minions could come back and consolidate those tendencies that already exist that we saw in a militarized form on, on January 6th of last year, but have been in, in a presence in this country for many, many years before that. Armed in most cases against people of color, 
not armed in most cases against the Capitol building. But the notion that this was the first time there was an armed attack against democratic forces in this country, that's not true. You know, we see it in the history of the Ku Klux Klan. We see it in the history of the, the attacks on communities of color that go back a hundred years to the, uh, the, the, um, the, the attacks on whole communities that were burnt to the ground. There's a long history of militarism in this country that plays out in violence against marginalized communities, impoverished communities, indigenous communities, the whole, the whole history of our country, what made it rich and powerful was grounded in that legacy of genocide against native people and the enslavement of African people. That's what made this country rich and powerful. And the notion that that's all done and, and over, that's all in the past, is certainly not borne out by today's realities. So I think when we talk about democracy, we really do have an obligation to start here. That includes building internationalism. That's part of the obligation of being the wealthiest country in history, not just the wealthiest country in the world today, the wealthiest country in history. You know, that means responsibilities to the rest of the world. It means when we are able to put the billions of dollars quickly into amazingly updated laboratories and they can create a vaccine, we have an obligation to make that vaccine accessible to the whole world, not to dole out a few hundred doses here and there while maintaining complete control over how to, how to build it, how to create it, what's the recipe for that vaccine. We don't have a right to do that. That should be a crime. In any democratic system, it would be a crime. Unfortunately, our country is not democratic enough to identify that as a crime. So we have a huge amount of work to do here before we start thinking about what's our role in bringing democracy to the Soviet Union. We did that in a way and we got Russia. We have now the same challenge that we faced then. What's our role in bringing democracy to Russia? I don't think that's our job. We don't have much to point to as why we're so good at it. We're not very good at it at home. Why do we think we're gonna be good at it across the world? We haven't done very well where we have created regime change on our terms. We created governments that the people didn't support because they're not the kind of government they wanted. That was certainly true in Afghanistan, was certainly true in Iraq, was certainly true in Haiti. It's been true in far too many places around the world. When we support one side in wars that are being waged, as one of our listeners reminded us about the war in Yemen, the US is a player in the war on Yemen and it's on the wrong side by any stretch of any human imagination. Why do we think that because this time we think it's the right side to, to be on, on playing a, a military role that somehow it's going to end better. The US doesn't have a very good history of any of our military in interventions ending better. I don't think that militarism is going to be an answer this time either. A really principled response and I accept your amendment to my question. You're exactly right, Phyllis. Um, we, you know, democracy is on the back foot here in this country as well. Um, and so I will ask a more modest version of this question to you, Curry, uh, considering the fact that we have just a few minutes left. Um, should we be playing a role in kind of aiding a kind of democratization in Russia, especially considering what's happening in this country and the crisis of democracy that we're reckoning with in America? I, yeah, I think that the, I think the question is really, how do we, so, you know, un appreciating the level of, um, it's appreciating what's happening here, which I'll, I'll say more <laughs> in a second. How do we defend democratic rights? Um, you know, where we are, how do we advance progressive and liberatory agendas? And how do we do those things with an eye to internationalism, you know, and, and recognize that there is, um, there's, this, there's this transnational phenomenon. I mean, this, this discussion has been incredibly rich. Um, 
And uh, you know, there have been points where we've agreed and points where we've disagreed. One point of, uh, and all of which I think has been quite generative, one point of convergence you know, is our recognition of a transnational project by um, you know, the particularly right-wing uh, authoritarians um, uh, you know, who, who kind of um, feed each other's um, projects. Or, or, or actually, they, they understand that they are advancing um, national projects in a transnational context. And just you know, the, the latest piece of evidence to me, or, or kind of example of that, is um, I learned recently that CPAC, the, you know, the hor horrendous uh, conference that happens every year in Washington where there's a certain um, agenda setting, you know, at least ideologically and politically for, for the, the American right. Um, they're actually having a conference in Hungary uh, soon. And that's not, you know, that's, that's not accidental. They, they see what's happening in Hungary and they want to compare notes with, um, you know, the, the, the Viktor Orban and, and the people, um, you know, advancing uh, his agenda uh, in, in Hungary. So they, they see this sort of transnational convergence and we have to have an eye to that too, particularly because the United States actually plays such a massive role in putting you know, the wind uh, in the sails of, of authoritarians all around the world. So that said, you know, just to go back to the question around, um, around advancing democracy and, 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 and w w looking at Russia, it, it, it can, the idea of wanting democracy everywhere, you know, or wanting democratic societies is, you know, I, I think that that's, that's something that's, that's uh, fine, but the way that, the problem with the way democracy and, um, and its opponents are framed in the mainstream conversation in the United States is I'm concerned that they deflect from what's happening here. You know, I mean, it, it, Phyllis talked about Trump in January 6th. I mean, there, there's any there's any number of you know of problems that we're seeing. We we're we're seeing the impacts of what happens when Trump appointed a bunch of federal judges. Now those judges are in positions of power and they're making decisions that are that are impacting uh, uh, the society in a big way. You know, it's all across this country. I'll say I'll, I'll just say I'm per, I'm awake, kept awake at night by what is happening in places like Texas and Florida and Alabama um, and Oklahoma, you know, the, the laws that are going after LGBT folks, going after trans youth in particular, the open redrawing of, um, you know, election districts to favor uh, Republicans, um, the stacking of election boards by people who, you know, don't agree that the 2020 election happened or whatever. Um, you know, that's what's happening here. <laughs> um, so, you know, and, and I think that truthfully, we, 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 we talk about the different we's and the different levels of we. I'll, I will say we as a progressive community or social movements or whatever, I don't think we have yet figured it out. We are not doing enough to beat back those attacks. So I think that the first question is that, in doing so with, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's important that so many people have uh, in this country have come to a new interest, a new engagement um, and so on in, in international politics in light of uh, this Ukraine crisis. That can be part of and should be part of an internationalist worldview um, and one that is, is, is grounded in what we're doing here, which is really quite urgent. Uh, wow, what an incredible conversation. I can't believe we're already at 1.30. Uh, so I think we have to draw this to a close. It's been an incredible uh, back and forth. And I really appreciate the fact that we're able to have this great conversation and we're coming from different perspectives, but we're all interested in the idea of uh, coming up with solutions that benefit the Ukrainian people. Uh, and also thinking deeply and critically about the issues that we're confronting here in this country as well. Um, I want to thank Phyllis Curry and John for doing this and for your fantastic analysis and thank all of you so much for tuning in. Uh, please be sure to keep up with the latest analysis from IPS through our email newsletter and our social media, all of which can be found at our website, ips-dc.org. Stay tuned for more information about our next lunch table talk and I wish all of you a fantastic day. <laughs>